now going to hand over to Ben. He will talk to you about um, international transfers and strengths too. Yeah, thanks, Colvin. Um, so as Nigel alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the last year has been quite eventful in the world of international data transfers, and there's been quite a few significant changes that have taken place. Uh, without doubt, uh, the biggest change uh, that's taken place has uh, stemmed from the Schrems II ruling of the European Court of Justice, uh, and the decision was issued in July last year, um, and this is what we'll, we'll spend uh, the most time on uh, in this section. Uh, the, the Schrems II case itself has been pretty well documented by this stage, so I won't go into details of the facts, but from a legal perspective, uh, there were two main consequences. So firstly, it uh, invalidated the EU-US Privacy Shield as a transfer mechanism. And secondly, uh, the bit that we're going to focus on, uh, the European Court upheld the validity of the standard contractual clauses, but only with major conditions attached, um, with the court ruling that organisations that are relying on the standard contractual clauses need to carry out a transfer impact assessment to assess whether they... Um, ensure an equivalent level of protection for the data that's transferred under them. And if not, then uh, the parties need to adopt supplementary measures uh, to ensure that level of protection. Uh, so in the months following the, the Schrems II decision, we were all sort of scrambling about trying to uh, make sense of it and figure out what's meant by transfer impact assessment and supplementary measures. Um, thankfully, in, in November time last year, the European Data Protection Board issued some draft guidance on these matters. Um, so firstly, taking uh, transfer impact assessments, what, what's involved with these? Um, well, the European Data Protection Board says that a transfer impact assessment essentially amounts to carrying out a review of the relevant laws and customs which apply in the country of the data importer and assessing whether these would prevent the standard contractual clauses from working properly. Um, this represents uh, quite a significant undertaking for data exporters, obviously, because usually they won't have any presence in the country that they're sending the data to, and they'll probably not have any experience of the, the laws that apply there either. Uh, as a result, the European Data Protection Board suggests that data exporters and data importers should work together when carrying out a transfer impact assessment. Um, and that may seem realistic for the large data importers with deep pockets, such as the likes of Microsoft and Amazon. Uh, it seems slightly less realistic for um, smaller data importers that might be receiving data sort of on an, on an ad hoc basis. Um, so yeah, we're, we're still trying to guide companies through that and uh, yeah, uh, um, you may find some resistance uh, in terms of the company that you're transferring the data to. In terms of the relevant laws um, which data importers and exporters should be looking out for, the EDPB highlights um, a few sort of positive and negative indicators to be taken into account. Uh, but by far, the issue that's given the most attention uh, are the public surveillance laws that apply in the third country uh, and whether these go beyond what is necessary uh, and are excessive. This isn't really surprising because uh, in the, the Schrems II case, the European Court sort of focused on the excessive nature of uh, US surveillance laws um, when discussing transfer impact assessments and also the Privacy Shield. Um, so to assist data exporters carry out a review of the surveillance laws in place in the country of the data importer, uh, the European Data Protection Board has also produced some separate guidelines called the European Essential Guarantees, and they set out the sort of the relevant criteria you should be looking at uh, when evaluating uh, surveillance laws in place in the third country. Once the parties have completed a transfer impact assessment, uh, the data exporter needs to document this. Uh, and if the transfer impact assessment shows that the standard contractual clauses would not be enough on their own to ensure an equivalent level of protection for the transferred data, then supplementary measures need to be uh, adopted by the parties. In terms of what 
supplementary measures uh, you can adopt. Well, the EDPB's guidance essentially sets out three broad types of measures. There's technical measures, uh, contractual measures, and organizational measures. Technical measures are probably the most important category of supplementary measures, um, as these are the only ones that the European Data Protection Board considers can uh, protect against excessive surveillance laws in the country of the data importer. Uh, and examples of types of technical measures include strong encryption uh, and also pseudonymization of the data uh, prior to it being uh, transferred. Contractual measures are essentially what they say on the tin um, is uh, the parties including additional obligations in their uh, respective contracts uh, in relation to the data that's being transferred. So, for example, you could have additional clauses around uh, data subject rights and how the data importer will help individuals exercise these. Um, Organisational measures are particularly relevant in the context of intra-group transfers and they refer to things such as having in place uh, group-wide policies to deal with uh, access requests received from public authorities, for example. Whilst the uh, European Data Protection Board's guidance is helpful um, to an extent, it provides limited assistance for parties that need to transfer personal data to countries that are deemed to have excessive uh, surveillance laws, and that, that would include the US. Uh, the guidance effectively says that it won't usually be possible for parties to transfer data to these types of countries in a clear form anyway. Uh, so that means in a sort of human readable format. And that's really unhelpful because uh, usually if you're transferring data to someone the, other, the recipient of the data will need to be able to access it in clear form to be able to achieve their purposes in relation to receiving the data. Um, so we're kind of hoping that the ICO will issue more practical guidance on this in due course, uh, but that's yet to be seen. Uh, and notwithstanding this, in the meantime, uh, organizations should still be carrying out a review of the transfers they carry out and the lawful mechanisms they rely on for making those transfers, um, carrying out transfer impact assessments to the extent that they rely on standard contractual clauses, and where appropriate, putting in place uh, supplementary measures to provide additional uh, protection um, for the data that's being trans transferred. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, um, another significant development in the past year relates to the publication of the new standard contractual clauses. And these have been prepared by the European Commission and a draft were published in uh, November time last year. Um, and these are designed to replace the existing standard contractual clauses, which are a bit outdated and predate the GDPR. So the, the draft standard contractual clauses that have been issued by the Commission They've been quite heavily scrutinized and also uh, criticized a bit by the European Data Protection Board. So I sp suspect that they will change a bit over time. Uh, but some of the key notable differences from the existing SECs include the fact that they, they cover a, a broader range of tra transfer scenarios. Uh, so currently the existing uh, standard contractual clauses only cover controller to controller and controller to processor transfers. Uh, the new standard contractual clauses will also cover processor to sub-processor transfers and processor to controller transfers. Uh, and that's important because those types of transfers have essentially been a bit of a, a grey area since the GDPR came into force in 2018. Uh, another significant change is that the draft, uh, the new SCCs can be used by non-EU entities, which is pretty important now that the GDPR has extraterritorial reach and meaning that non-EU uh, companies can be caught by it. And finally, uh, the new SECs also take into account the Schrems II ruling and notably require the parties to carry out a transfer impact assessment prior to entering into them. So it's expected that the, the draft uh, clauses will be finalised in the coming weeks um, and once approved, organizations that are currently transferring personal data on the basis of the existing SECs will have one year to transition to the new clauses. 
However, there's a bit of a, a spanner in the works for UK companies, and that's because the ICO has recently announced that it's working on a new set of bespoke standard contractual clauses for the UK. Um, and the ICO's website now says that UK companies transferring data will need to use these UK specific clauses rather than using the EU, uh, the new EU standard contractual clauses. So as if uh, things weren't confusing enough already, uh, once the new UK and EU standard contractual clauses have been approved, you could end up in a situation where you need to have both sets incorporated into one agreement um, to cover the transfer of UK and EU personal data to a data importer. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, and I just wanted to mention briefly Brexit, uh, given that the Brexit transition period came to an end uh, at the end of last year. In terms of uh, its impact on data transfers, um, the position is essentially the same for companies in the UK. Uh, the UK has adopted the same adequacy decisions as the EU Commission uh, for the time being, and also recognises EU member states as having an place an adequate level of protection so you can transfer data to them freely. Uh, as discussed, we're going to have new standard contractual clauses soon that we'll need to use. Um, and then in terms of transfers going the other way, so from the EU to the UK, uh, the trade cooperation agreement entered into between the UK and the EU uh, effectively provided for an additional transition, transitional period during which transfers could be made to the UK unrestricted. And that's going to expire at the end of June this year. Um, but the good news is that the EU Commission has issued a draft adequacy decision in February this year in respect of the EU. And that's broadly been endorsed by the European Data Protection Board. Uh, and therefore, we there is um, reason to believe uh, and it's expected that the adequacy decision will be uh, finalised before the end of uh, June and the end of the transitional period, which is good news.